And I remember opening that hatch and just looking out and it looked just like being in the stack at night off the carrier in the Pacific Ocean. It's a little terrifying, but it's glorious to be out there. Nine day camping expedition. With the Look. best view you could ever have. It's the golden era of human spaceflight right now. It's a wonderful thing. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello, and this is my friend, Matt Arney. You longtime audio listeners of the show have heard Flounder. He's been on plenty of times. And you video watchers, well, they just saw you last time on our episode about NFOs. Welcome back, Flounder. Thanks, Jello. It's great to be here again. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we're on this side of the table this week because you're helping with your first video interview. Now, you conducted that several months ago, so tell us a little background about where you found this guest and the subject and uh, what led you to go pursue that interview. Yeah, I'm really excited about this interview ever since I thought of it. So a little back, I recorded the episode with Doug Hurley about the his experience with the space shuttle and with Crew Dragon being the first uh, Crew Dragon uh, astronauts with him and Bob Mankin. And so that was really a lot of fun. And so I know this is a fighter pilot podcast, but I I'm also a big fan of space, and I just thought, you know, I had been on cruise with Reed Wiseman Tonto a number of years ago as we were flying Super Hornets, and uh, as you'll hear in the interview, but I just wanted to reach out to him and say, hey, can we come down to Houston and do this? And NASA and Reed were gracious enough to give us an hour of his time at a great location. So it was just a lot of fun to make that happen. Yeah. Well, speaking of that location, as viewers will see in a moment, it's really sort of dynamic. And at one point, I think I even see someone in the background working on a computer or something. Where was this venue? Yeah. So like you said, we went down to Johnson Space Center. I'd been to Cape Canaveral a few times, but I'd never been there. Mm -hmm. Really amazing facility. Great museum there and uh, and great facility and, and great people. So when I was working with NASA on the availability, uh, we looked at, there's a Orion training module that we looked at, or we looked at possibly going to the airfield where the T-38s are, but we landed on this, and this is called the Beta Dome. And so there's two domes, the Alpha Dome and the Beta Dome, and they're used for training the astronauts and also doing software evaluation. You know, the engineers get in there and do different things. And so it's a dome facility. We were able to open it up so you could look inside. It's got the Orion module as a mock-up, so that you can fly the Orion module in this dome facility and and do the different things that the engineers need to do or the astronauts need to do to train. So it's a really, really interesting facility. Yeah, it looked like it. And I think you'll, at the end, talk about the location you're at, but for impatient viewers like me, it might be fun to just kind of know where you guys are. But I guess let's just get to it because it's such a fun discussion. You guys do spend quite a bit of time talking about background and Tomcats and all that. Of course you got to talk Tomcats. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, you get to the Artemis and what he's doing. So uh, I say we Go ahead and roll tape. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. On this episode, we're here at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and we've got a very special guest today, Reed Wiseman. Reed, thanks for joining us. This is awesome. And it's going to get even more awesome today. So first of all, I wanted to thank all the folks here at Johnson Space Center. They've been really amazing Great. helping us out. And just like we're going to talk about with flying F-14s or flying Orion spacecraft. It's not just the people in the cockpit or in the capsule, it's everybody else on this team who makes it happen. So really want to express gratitude right off the start. That's awesome. Well, good. We got to know each other a little bit back in the Tomcat flying days, which we're going to talk about here, but uh, life is good here at NASA for you, huh? Life is great. I mean, as you mentioned in the lead-in, it is really all about the people. One of the things I love most about flying the F-14 was how hard it was to fly that aircraft and how hard it was to maintain that aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually got a note on Facebook Messenger this weekend from one of my old maintainers in VF-31. And just the way I still connect to those folks that kept that machine flying, it feels a lot similar here where it is this team. Mission Control is right across the street from us, and they're operating the International Space Station right now. And then on Orion Spacecraft and Space Launch System, just the team of people that are putting this thing together and then are going to help us fly it. 
that when you get to work every day, you just smile because these are the greatest of Americans and international partners. Yeah, that's a really great point. You know, you, a lot of people think about like the fighter pilot community and how close we are as aviators, but also that closeness with the maintenance folks because we work with them all the time you know, in the Tomcat, trying to get the Tomcat off the Absolutely. deck sometimes and all that kind of stuff. So speaking of flying Tomcats, so... Quick, how did you get Wait, how from, much? How much time do we yeah, have? Yeah, I know. This is, <laughs> well, yeah, we have a good amount of time, but this is going to go by quickly. So you grew up in Baltimore and then RPI, engineering computer degree. Yeah, or? computer and systems engineering, which was basically, this was the late 90s and computers were all the rage. And this was really, how do you design a microprocessor for a computer kind of device? And then it started to get into networking as well, but it was really kind of hardcore uh, engineering at that time. And I, I was fascinated by that degree. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, good on you. So then your commission was through what? Well, ROTC? ROTC, yeah. Yep. ROTC. So you did ROTC up there at RPI. So then when did you decide you wanted to fly Navy and fly the Tomcat? How'd that work oh, out? I wanted to fly from a fairly young age. The way I've told myself the story is, first, uh, growing up in Maryland, we lived near a quarry. And freight trains would come into that quarry all the time. And my dad, if we heard the horn, my dad would drive me down to the quarry. And we would just sit on the side of the road and watch these freight trains come in and go out. And over time, one of the conductors, the guy's name was Harry, like he just always saw this dad and his son sitting on the side of the road. And one day he stopped the whole train and invited us up and let us drive That's the train. That's amazing. The, right? So like that was where my fascination began with these like larger than life machines. Uh, we also lived near, uh, I think, an Air National Guard base and A-10s would fly in and out of there all the time. So by the time I got to high school, I knew I wanted to do something like fly airplanes. And really, I was thinking about the Air Force. And then my brother had joined the Navy and I was out in California with him and I saw two F-18s like departing out of Miramar and just heading out to sea. Mm -hmm. And that was where all of a sudden I was like, oh, that is ex like that spark hit me. That's exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to go out to ships. I want to be completely off the grid and, and operate from the cockpit of a fighter jet. And I went to RPI. I definitely had some setbacks. I had some medical issues with an eye surgery that I had had when I was a kid. So my first application got denied. Mm. I tried really hard. I got a waiver, uh, got accepted into flight school. And then from there, I think once I got to flight school, I almost just said I was relaxed, which I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, I was really amped up. Yeah. Um, I wanted to fly fighters, and then if I hadn't flown fighters, I would have flown helicopters. And I would have been happy as a clam in either one of those two communities. Uh, but I just worked hard. One thing that I did while I was training uh, emergency procedures is I thought I need to distract myself. So I learned how to juggle, and I would just walk around my neighborhood juggling golf balls, juggling. reciting emergency procedures for the T-34, and then I carried that with T-45. I carried that with F-14, F-18. I still do that to this day. Like I juggle as I do emergency procedures just to be thinking about multiple things all at one time. Mm -hmm. I, I just chainsaws, thought that flaming torches? No, I've never done chainsaws, never done flaming okay. torches. <laughs> My career in flight school was great and one thing led to another and I was one of the last folks to get Tomcats. I mean, they were kind of winding down. Everybody wanted Hornets, but mm -hmm. I wanted to fly the big fighter. I wanted to know what that was like and it was our only opportunity. I didn't want to miss that chance. That's right. So how old were you and when you were at Miramar and saw those oh. hornets. And what did your brother do? Uh, my brother was a SEAL. Okay. And he told me if I went into special warfare, he would personally beat me up. <laughs> like, there was no way. He just knew me. He was like, you are not a good fit for that community. <laughs> I guess I was probably about 15. Okay. Right around that time. Yeah, like that formative time yeah. uh, where anything can spark your imagination and it like all clicks in your head. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And then, so then through flight training, so that was when we were in T-34s and T2s and A4 or I, I, just, I went straight to Kingsville to do T45s. Okay. At the time, there was a mishap in a T2 and a student had gotten killed and they lost the aircraft. And so they had grounded the T2 fleet for months and months and months. Mm. That was right when I finished T34. So I had no option. I couldn't go fly T2, TA4. Okay. I went straight to Kingsville into the T45A. Uh, it worked out great for me. Yeah, that is. Uh, that's great. So like you said, one of the last guys to get into Tomcats. When was this? I got winged in 99. So there was, okay. there was, a, like, there was maybe like a mini generation after us. Yep. But I didn't have an opportunity after my junior officer tour to fly Tomcats again. Like they were they were sundown while I was on my shore tour. Yeah. And then you went right into that 14D in VF31. 
So greatest airplane ever built by humans. I joke that <laughs> that humans were invented to create the F-14. Like that is the most beautiful machine. And I, I was lucky to fly the D yeah. uh, with the full glass cockpit, heads up display. We had an infrared search and track system on that thing. G110s. Oh, the big motors. Yeah. <laughs> that thing was just a beast and I loved it. Yeah. That's great. Now we can get into it because I was a B upgrade guy. So <laughs> we always had the B upgrade versus D. You, you guys know, had some great toys. I will we give did. you that. You had some great toys. Yeah. But from that piloting perspective, like the Tomcat just brought the best of all worlds together. We had that Link 16 data link way before anybody else had it. That's right. We had ABG-71, which was a hugely powerful radar at the time. Now, whether or not any of these systems worked when you flew, <laughs> that was neither here nor there. As long as you had the motors, uh, you were going somewhere. Yeah, that's right. So... You went right to VF-101. That's when we had taken the West Coast because there was a yeah. D-RAG when I went through the FRS. You're that old? Yeah, I am that old. I know I don't look it. I try to look distinguished. I didn't know. So, did yeah. you train at Miramar? No. So guys I got winged with, uh, like, uh, you know, some, some D guys like Greg Gallman and, you know, some of the other guys went off to Miramar to what was a small debt for D training. <sighs> And so when I was at Oceana, they consolidated that one on one. So by the time you came through a couple of years after me, you went right to Oceana. We were full, fully consolidated into one on one there at Oceana. But you only flew the D. Only at ever the rag. flew the D. Yeah. Okay. So then when I went to VX9 after that out in Point Bagu, that's where I started getting more D time. Okay. And, you know, it was really fun coming from a B upgrade background to the D. But like you said, I mean, great radar, great systems but really fun to see the perspective of both airplanes. So piloting though, you know, I'm from the Rio side, you're the pilot side. So, I mean, what was the fun about flying the Tomcat for you? <laughs> uh, I mean, every, every, it was just art. That airplane was art, right? You're sitting in the front of this gigantic machine. For those that know the, the F-14, you got the jail bar forward windscreen, you know, that little windscreen that you're looking through this structural metal there. So the view was good, but it wasn't great. It wasn't an F-16. It wasn't an F-18. Mm -hmm. you, you had a slightly restrictive view out the front, but you just had, you had so much power. I personally loved flying with a Rio. I liked having somebody there to back me up, an extra set of eyes. And I mean, an F-14, you could see that thing from 30 miles away. So in a dogfight, I always needed an extra <laughs> set of eyes. That's right. Otherwise I would be done in a second. But it really was an art. The thing was very hard to fly. It really took two people and it took a huge maintenance team on the ground to keep that airplane going. At the time, it just seemed like it had unlimited power. I remember the first flight I ever did was with Opie Seth. In the first flight, they put a pilot in your back seat, right? It's pilot, pilot. Just, I guess, for somebody to talk you down because there's no second set of controls. I remember going out over the Atlantic Ocean off of Oceana and I look at my mirrors and I just see this machine behind me. The biggest thing I'd flown up till then was a T-45 Gossock. Mm -hmm. And I looked in the mirrors and I was like, Opie, I'm not gonna be able to land this thing. Like this thing is <laughs> this, huge. It's a lot yeah. of airplane to land. Your first flight, you got the only set of controls. Now I gotta wrestle this thing back to the ground. And there was plenty of buffoonery in that, in that mm. machine, you know, coming in and accidentally sweeping your wings back when you're trying to take off or trying to land. And yeah, they just there was a lot of ways to hurt yourself in that thing. So you always had to be, you always had to be cautious. And to this day, that is the only airplane I still dream about. Yeah. I still dream about flying that airplane. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you mentioned how big it is. One of the things I love doing on pre-flight, especially on the ship, was when you get up on the back. On the turtle back yeah, there? Yeah, on the turtle back and just be on this expanse of, it was like right out of the 70s, you know, of there's no substitute for cubic inches. Let's build it big, <laughs> let's build it powerful. And so those were some moments that I really enjoyed out there with the Tomcat. Completely agree. Yeah. So you were at 31 and you deployed on which ships? That was the Lincoln through and through. We were on the USS Abraham Lincoln. Mm, so you're doing the cross country over to deploy out the West Coast? Absolutely. We would transit out to either San Diego or up to Washington, and we would meet our carrier out there because the Lincoln was stationed up in, in Seattle in Everett. Yeah. And uh, But then sometimes they would come down to San Diego, pick us up and head out from there. And then sometimes we would leave out of out of Seattle, uh, which mm. was really neat, doing carrier calls right off the coast up there, mm. uh, just a few miles offshore where you're on downwind looking over houses and making a left turn in to land on an aircraft carrier like, that was, yeah. that was special. That is amazing. No, that's great. Uh, so speaking of landing on the carrier, so back to the T-45, you did your first CQ on that, and then bring the Tomcat aboard in VF-101 for your first traps. What, what did that feel like for you? And how was that getting through that whole process of landing on the boat? 
First, I guess if you want to talk about landing an F-14, you need to go have an interview with Lucas Kadar. Yeah. Who I know you know, Spicoli, because yeah. there is no human being that landed that airplane better than Lucas. So go talk to Lucas at some point. But I think wrestling the Tomcat down on the deck of the aircraft carrier, it was always a challenge. There was never a time when I trapped in that airplane at night and my right leg wasn't shaken when I tried to taxi it out of the landing area. Like, mm. you have to be 100% gamed up, top notch, adrenaline flowing every time you bring that thing aboard. You know, where we had our fun was the daytime. And as you get better and better in the daytime, that was when you can come in faster and you can, you know, be a little bit more aggressive and, you know, show off a little bit for the people on the flight deck. And that sort of enjoyment, if I could get a launch that would come back right at sunset where you're still case one, so you can come in yep. to the overhead pattern and land on the carrier at sunset and you can tap the afterburners going over the ship, like, perfect day. Yeah. I'll take that day forever. That's a that's a beautiful day. The other beautiful day is getting that 45-minute cycle on the front end. Oh, man. And just Where blasting you just leave off the burners on. in all the way up to 40,000 feet. Absolutely. <laughs> beautiful, clear day. Coming back for the case one. Those are some good times, too. Absolutely agree. Oh, yeah. my gosh. What ships did you CQ aboard? Uh, in T-45's day only was the Kennedy. Okay. And then in 101, uh, day night was on the Enterprise, which was pretty neat to be mm -hmm. on that. So that's two old carriers that I did my carrier qualifications on. And mm -hmm. in 101, you got to pick your Rio when you went to the boat. At least we got to pick who we flew with. And uh, I, I picked this great guy. His call sign was Preacher because I was going to the boat and I needed somebody really close <laughs> to God to get yeah. me through this. And he did. I mean, it was really fun. It was so fun flying that airplane what you guys would do in the back for us when we were struggling in the front. Like, I had Jolly Rancher candy sent up to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I had pep talks given. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, all kinds of stuff that, that would just help you get aboard. And that is a testament to how hard that plane was to land on the carrier, especially at night, where, you know, in an F-18, I don't think I ever once got a pep talk from anybody because that plane's a, it's an awesome airplane. It's pretty easy to land. Mm. Tomcat, I mean... And I know the guy in the back was probably just struggling, like, please, please get me <laughs> please, aboard. Yeah, please, please get me aboard. And I'll do, you know, whatever you need. Do you want VSI <laughs> calls? you want Jolly Ranchers? Whatever yep. you need. I'm behind you the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So true. Yeah. But now talk about, you know, we've had a few people on talking about PLM nowadays. Oh, yeah. You know, flying those things with precision landing mode and, you know, all that stuff. I think I mentioned on a, another one. I had the opportunity to take the boys to Tailhook for the first time recently. Nice. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And they got to fly the F-35 and the F-18. And, you know, those things are just flying themselves. But a lot of information coming in. Yeah, that's that's a difference. I, you know, we're all wizards now. We're all weapon systems officers, regardless of where you sit. And you mm. know, I was seeing that even... 15 years ago when I left the Navy, just how much information is coming into the crew in the cockpit and how much you have to think and how how much you rely on these precision landing modes and autopilots just to get the, the basics of flying done so that you can execute the mission because the mission is incredibly complicated. Yeah, and you mentioned with the F-14D, you know, we had Link 16, we had JTIDs, two channels of JTIDs, you got your two UHF radios, you got your ICS. So even in the D, you started seeing a lot of this stuff where you're having to bring all this information in. Actually, I just pushed it all to the back seat because yeah. <laughs> they were just consuming everything. <laughs> like doing the forward air controller airborne roll in that airplane, you, mm -hmm. you just felt like a complete battlefield commander in the F-14D because yeah. you had so many radios, you had so much link capability, and you had two people. That was my favorite of all the missions I got, I got yeah. to fly. It was like forward air control where you're just, you're managing other aircraft, you're helping out the troops on the ground, you're making a real difference in somebody's day, and you're challenging yourself. I, I loved all that. That's right. That was a great mission. Only a few got to be fat case. Boom. Giddy up. Absolutely. So where'd you do your JTAC training then? Uh, I did that down uh, with the Marines. I think we did it outside Lejeune. It was myself yeah. and uh, Dale Gregory, who just screened for Aircraft Carrier Commanding Officer. That's right. Way to go, T-Bone. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, we did that. And it was amazing to work with the Marines and, uh, and to see the professionalism that they carried into the, the terminal air control world. It was really fantastic as a Navy guy to get to go work with that professional outfit. Yeah, absolutely. I did mine with uh, Zingo Ben Renda out in the West Coast. We got to nice. go to the ranges out in the West Coast, 29 Palms. But that was a lot of fun. Like you said, you know, now you're taking that extension of you got your two people in the airplane, you got other crews that you're flying with, but now you're taking that to managing cast stacks of other assets yep. coming in, all serving the ground force commander. 
So there were a lot of great, great opportunities there. And then we're going to go skip past TPS and test here real quick. You came to VFA 103 after you did your CAG 17 time. So sticking with the FAC A, because it's going to be easy for us to go down tangents real quick. So <laughs> we're just going to try to stay on the FAC A thing real quick. So did you recall when you went to your department, Ed? What do you think? Of course. A hundred percent. When I was going to my department at tour, I asked for two seat Super Hornets because again, it was that mission. It was that crew coordination. Like that was my passion in, in flying. I just, I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. And then you get into rescue mission commander. Oh, I did those out in Fallon. Oh, oh my gosh. That's the hardest. Like I, I remember doing strike league qualification yep. and I did that in a, in a rescue mission RMC, 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 yeah, RMC yeah. roll. And I remember landing that night and just, I had to sit in the cockpit for about 10 minutes because I was so exhausted. Yeah. Like just the thought of getting out and walking across the tarmac, I was, I was done. I, it was all left in the simulated battlefield. Like That's it took right. every ounce of my capacity to do that role. Yeah. So we had the RMC missions and then I don't know if you, we also had the soft escort missions. We did a lot of soft escort. Yep. Those scenarios in Fallon were just amazing. And I remember to this day, I was flying with Wood Becker and guy. yeah, and department head in 103, bef a couple of years before your, your time in 103. And same thing, just nighttime soft escort. There's so much stuff going on. I had surface to air rings lighting yep. off on my display and, you know, we're doing sam waves and all kinds of stuff, orchestrating things. It just, like you said, you left it all on the field. It's, you know, it's, those it's times. mentally and physically as taxing as, as anything could possibly be, I think. Yeah, intense. Yeah. So, all right. So let's back up. So at some time in 31, you decide, or maybe it was before that, you're like, I want to go be a test pilot. Because you, you pretty much have your weapons school folks, your test pilot, or your you know training, whether it's FRS or VT. So what got you down the test pilot route? I might annoy 99% of your audience, but to me, I, like Top Gun did not resonate with me. Mm -hmm. It was not in my soul. I fully appreciated the training that they went through. And then I I strongly desired the instruction that I got from them. I mean, they're the the professional aviators in the United States Navy are our Top Gun graduates. There's no doubt. They are our experts. But for me, I think coming from Rensselaer, having a technical background, like I am a geek at heart and I wanted to learn more about how are we developing the all the manuals? How are we developing these aircraft? What do we do to make sure when we give it to the warfighter that it's it's at least semi good to go? Mm -hmm. um, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to go study calculus again and learn a little bit about aerodynamics. And I applied to test pilot school, uh, got in and off to PAX I went. Uh, straight from VF-31. And that is, that's a tough transition, going from your combat unit, from your brothers and sisters that is like a family, and then now you're on a shore tour, and the mission is very gentle, and there, you know, there's, the pace of life was a little bit different, the school was very hard, but it just, it's a big culture shock. Yeah, so three years operational, uh, going out to do good work. So then one year at test pilot school. Correct. Flying the T-38. And what else did you get to yeah, fly flew, there? I flew like 30 airplanes. One of the yeah. coolest. I flew gliders, helicopters. I got to fly uh, a DC-3. Um, oh, one of the neat. coolest things I did was a giant albatross, you know, old radial engines. And we did landings on Lake Tahoe. Oh, my goodness. To get some sea time in. Like, we just did all sorts of wonderful things. And then my capstone course was with the smartest guy you could ever meet, Colonel Doug Wickert Beaker uh, yeah. in the Air Force. So he and I went out to Sweden and we flew the Gripen over there and we did uh, like a mock evaluation of the Gripen, which was you know, a true delight. And that was when I realized, like, I can call myself a test pilot, but Doug Wickert that guy is a test pilot. Yeah. Like he just, everything was in his brain. It was amazing to get to work with him. That's really cool. Where did you fly the Gripen out of? Do you remember? What the uh, Linshoping. Linshoping was the town. I yeah. don't exactly remember. Yeah, Linshoping. Yeah, that was the uh, attache in Sweden. And I, no way. I, yeah, and I actually got to fly the Gripen uh, out of the north, out of Luleå. But yeah, I visited Linshoping many times. There. Oh, yeah. And the Gripen was such a fun airplane, too. So neat. Yeah. That's really neat. So you did that. And then, so then you go to, was it VX-23? I went right across the street to VX-23. Yeah. And being a Tomcat guy with no Hornet time, mm -hmm. um, I knew exactly where I was going and it was T-45 project office. That was a huge lesson learned for me, which was I went over there kicking and screaming. There was no part of me that wanted to go to the T-45 project office. I wanted to fly Super Hornets and I wanted to start building my future career in the Navy because there was not going to be a chance to go back to Tomcats. I felt like going to T-45s was like a nail in my 
military coffin. Uh, but I went over there. I worked with this guy, Flopper Murphy. It was just two of us, two test pilots. We had our own budget. We had two airplanes. And we were doing things. I realized when I got there, we were doing things that were making a huge difference in the training command. That thing had some directional control issues that uh, one of my classmates at Kingsville had gotten killed on an aircraft carrier, uh, Ryan Shelby. Hmm. And we were solving those issues. And we, we solved those issues. I was at the tail end of that, but I still felt very proud in that. And then I was able to sleuth my way into ship suitability to start working with the LSOs, the landing signal officers there at VX-23, standing on the back of the boat. And then I got into more and more F-18 tests, got an F-18 qual, got a Super Hornet qual, and ended up doing growler tests and F-35 developmental work. I never got in the F-35, but I was in the sim a lot. Hmm. So it was really neat to see how that command allowed me to build out my portfolio as I was there. But initially, T-45 project office. And I learned that, you know, there's a lot of value. Sometimes the less glamorous job can bring you the most reward. And I really look back and cherish that time I had. Yeah. And that's a lot to have done in, what, two years? Yeah, three years. I, but I was hungry. Like, yeah. I, it was a short tour, but I was hungry. I wanted to be marketable back out to the fleet. I wanted to get back out there and fly off of aircraft carriers. And the only way I knew I was going to be useful as a department head was if I had gotten some super hunted time. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, that's smart. Same thing with Top Gun and the weapons schools really valued what they provided, but I wanted to as well go more into the test world into VX9 and try to develop the systems that we could use against adversaries and, and maintain that dominance that we had. I didn't, I didn't know that much about like the operational test and the VX9 mission until I was a developmental test pilot and looking back. And honestly, I'm almost lucky I didn't know because I think that would have been my number one choice coming out of VF31, out of the Tomcat. The work that is being done out there on systems development, weapon system development, in hindsight, I think I would have enjoyed that immensely. Yeah, I'm sure you would have enjoyed it because um, there was a lot to enjoy, especially flying Tomcats out of Point Magoo for me. But Dude. yeah, those were some good days. But one of the things that you had to deal with going to the test community was, like you said, you had to make yourself marketable to come back. Whereas when you're at the weapon schools and you're a Top Gun, you're always interacting. You're yeah, you're not only marketable, but you're always interacting with folks. So, you know, getting back to the fleet units, kind of showing them what was going on and also trying to encourage people to come explore the task community Absolutely. too was something that we were having to do a lot. Man, this might not resonate, but one of the most important things leaving the test community and going to a department ed tour that mattered to me was I wanted the test community to have a good reputation back in the operational Navy. And so going to 103, I the amount of time I spent in the manuals, in the books, trying to read up on the modern tactics, how do we employ a Super Hornet? I didn't want anyone to look at me and think I was a test pilot. I wanted them to look at me and think I was a Top Gun graduate. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the patch, but that was my mindset going in. Like I have got to be as hungry as possible right now, learn as much as I can about employing this machine because I knew my knowledge was very low. Yeah, that's right. A lot of very technical knowledge, but not it war was fighting knowledge. Yeah. War fighting and being deliberate about doing that. But yeah, that's that was smart. So you did that time at Pax River and a lot of amazing work there. And then you end up coming to CAG staff. And so that's where we started as we were talking. I was in 103, but I was working CAG Ops at the time and you came. What was your role there on the CAG staff? So it's it's interesting that we even ever cross paths because uh, from VX-23, I went to CAG-17 on the East Coast because I knew the Air Wing commander there and one of my best friends, Jeff Bowman, was in the staff there. So it felt like a great fit. So I went there to be the strike ops officer. But at that time, CAG-17 had no air wing. So we were a staff without aircraft. And so I started uh, coming over to the Rippers in 11, 103. I went out to a few other squadrons, some uh, Hornet squadrons to get some, some single seat Charlie time. And I started flying with those folks. And then CAG-7, uh, they were on deployment and they knew that we, we basically had no air wing. So they invited Jeff Bowman and myself out to the ship to spend time with CAG-7 underway. Just otherwise we would have had a two year tour with no operational time at all. Uh, so that was really nice. Uh, I think Sterno was the CAG at that time. He was. He invited us out. Yeah. Um, and that was how I started to intersect with you and with 103 and CAG-7. Yeah, that's another interesting point you bring up because we were in 103, joined in Tomcats and CAG-17. So we come back to do the Super Hornet transition. And like you said, CAG-17 just got- Just disbanded. Yeah, decimated. And so they still maintained the air wing staff but you guys were kind of doing little things here and there. And that happens every now and through right. our cycles where, you know, we know we're going to build it up again. So a guy like yourself, as you build up K-17, you got to have that strike ops understanding because people are going to be relying on you to do your job 
so that the Air Wing can have all its scheduled events together and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we were we were the glue that was just holding two operational time frames together in CAG 17. So we we had to be there. We had to do that. Yeah. So you spend that time at CAG staff and then you go to 103. 103 so, is department head. Yeah. And so you get selected for that. And then, so I was talking to Jinxie Cat before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he and I have like the deepest relationship where we found ourselves and what he got me through in CAG 7 was truly epic. <laughs> well, that's a funny thing. So he's saying that, you know, bringing you in country in a Super Hornet and you've got all of like 30 hours in it at that Maybe. point. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know how much of this we really want to go into, but <laughs> we're out there to do the most vanilla mission. We just had a, a photo pod on a sharp pod and we were going to go out and take some photographs over Afghanistan. And then next thing you know, it was early in the morning. That was when we did those routes. Like there was no chance of us having any sort of engagement with the enemy. We were in country for all of about five minutes and there were troops in contact and we were the only asset airborne. And so Jinxie Cat and I are heading in and, <laughs> and I had no business uh, doing that. I mean, I knew how to operate that airplane, yeah. but without Jinx in the back, there, there was no way we were going to succeed. And we ended up Winchester completely. I mean, we employed every bullet, every bomb that we had trying to keep the enemy forces from the U.S. forces who were doing, it was a construction battalion uh, working on a highway there who had come in contact. And we also had another CAG staff on our wing and an Echo, and he also expended all of his ordnance. And then we we were happy to stay on scene as long as needed, but we had nothing to give. We, mm -hmm. we, were, we were empty. Yeah, that's right. But the important thing for listeners to understand is, like we talked about, you had FAC-A background. When you were in 31, you had been in country. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I was hungry for this moment. I just didn't expect it to come with 30 hours in the airplane. That's in right. an airplane that I was borrowing from a squadron to go into combat with. It was just the whole thing. I knew the junior officers in 103 were going to detest me when That's I landed. Right. <laughs> because no one at that point on deployment had deployed. And here this CAG staff guy from a different air wing That's is right. in their airplane. And he goes in with Jinx and has, like, you know, one of the greatest close air support missions you could ever have. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's amazing. You never know when it's going to happen, but you're ready to do it when it happens. Because like we said earlier, you're supporting those ground force elements out there. And so it really gives a lot of great meaning Absolutely. to that. So you go into 103 and uh, at some point in 103, well, when did you apply for NASA? Was it before you I went to 103? I actually applied in CAG 17. That was where my letters went in. But you know, the NASA takes a long time to get the application process going and the interview process. So I started interviewing as our air wing was starting to deploy for my department head tour, which was an awkward time. Mm. But I had uh, Brian Garrison uh, was our commanding officer and incredibly Another supportive human being right there. Mm. Um, and Combat Kimmel was our XO. And yes, Combat, he was also <laughs> supportive in his own unique way. <laughs> Intense combat, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. So then you're on deployment, you hear about it, and then off to astronaut training. We've got a couple great podcasts with Scott Tingle, Great. who goes into a lot of that application and astronaut training stuff. And so I want to kind of accelerate through that, unless there's anything kind of nuanced or particular about your time through astronaut training. No, a thousand nuances, but I think you hit the nail on the head. I, if, if folks can go watch what my buddy Scott said, uh, I'm sure he's mm. way more literate than I am. <laughs> uh, some people would you know, debate that. But anyway, <laughs> we won't get into that here. So then you end up doing an ISS mission. This is post-shuttle. Right. You go into ISS. Into Scott and I got hired in 2009. We were in we were in the same class. And he was my boss at Pax River. So oh, I love, wow. I love, Scott Tingle and I are great. I just saw him. He was actually right across the hall from where we are uh, oh, this great. morning. I just saw him this morning. I got here in 2009 with Scott. I flew to the space station on a Russian Soyuz in 2014 to the International Space Station. And I, I think uh, I'll just, I'll keep this brief, but I was so sad that the shuttle had gone away. To me, that was the Tomcat of human spaceflight. Mm. Like everybody wanted to fly that thing, and I was sad it went away. Until I got to the space station and spent six months orbiting our Earth. And that was when I realized I would have flown the shuttle on a 10-day or two-week mission, and I would have missed that opportunity of living off the planet for six months, and I wouldn't have known what I was missing. But to get to be on space station, conducting science every day, learning to live off of our planet, getting to look down at Earth, to see every place I'd been in the Navy, every vacation I'd ever been on, to look down and analyze it from 250 miles up. That was the coolest thing I have ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. And 
I had a really cool experience following you through Astro you. Read and Twitter because <laughs> <laughs> it went a little crazy. Yeah, uh, but it was fun to do that. <laughs> but the camera shots you were taking were just this. I remember one in particular. I think it was in the cupola with the red dye. Oh yeah, that was you know hanging out there and just really some really neat, creative, amazing photographs out there to really share that experience. I know you talked to uh, Doug Hurley uh, earlier, uh, but his, his wife, Karen Nyberg, was a good friend of mine here before they moved to Utah. She was my motivation for that. I, when she flew about two years before I flew, I just watched the way she did photography. And she is, you can tell she's an artist. Mm. And the way that she would capture Earth, that is what I wanted to try to do while I was up there. And so I, everything I learned about photography, I learned from either Don Pettit on how to operate the camera, or from Karen Nyberg on that artistic way to just show how beautiful our Earth is. Mm -hmm. During that time, you did have an EVA? I had two spacewalks, uh, yeah. about six and a half hours each. First one, I went out with Alex Gerst, a German, and second one was with uh, Butch Wilmore, a fellow Navy pilot. I'm not sure the two of us uh, should have been outside together, <laughs> but we got the job done. It was fantastic to get to go work yeah. with him. What was that like the first time going outside? I expected to be completely terrified. I am scared of heights. Like I can't stand at the edge of a building. I can, I'm fine in a cockpit. I'm fine in space. But I was really worried uh, a couple of days before going out on that first spacewalk. But uh, myself and Alex Gerst were both rookies, and we were heading mm. out together on a rookie rookie spacewalk, which hadn't happened in a couple of decades here. Now it's commonplace. And I remember opening that hatch and just looking out, and it looked just like being in the stack at night off the carrier in the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. I could see the clouds down there, it was nighttime. I could see the Pacific Ocean just way underneath of us. And I was like, oh, this is nothing, I got this. And I went out and we got the job done. And it's, it's a little terrifying, but it's glorious to be out there. Mm -hmm. The only thing you have is your plexiglass visor that's keeping you safe. That's amazing. Uh, your little motor running to keep your, your oxygen system working. And then it's all about the ground teams just walking you through this really complicated maintenance task. And that is another thing where you, you look at a, at a spacewalk from Earth, like just watch it on TV. You can maybe watch about 10 minutes before you get so bored you turn it off. Yeah. Uh, but when you are out there, it is so mentally and physically taxing. It's just like that RMC role that we were talking about earlier. When you come in from that spacewalk, I came in from my first spacewalk and all I wanted to do was go home. Mm -hmm. I was just so done. I, everything I had left on the field. I wasn't frustrated. I was just exhausted. That's right. Mentally and yep. physically exhausted. One of the things I noted looking at Expedition 41, you guys like set some kind of record for, you mentioned the science experiments you're doing. So you're doing all kinds of experiments up there on ISS that are being brought up there for you guys to, to do out there. So you did like 82 hours of experiments. So, I mean, what kind of things did you have to learn to do to make sure these experiments run? We do a lot of training on Earth to learn how to run the machinery that is going to run the experiment. Mm -hmm. So you know the, all the machinery really well. The thing that's so wonderful when you're up there is you're running these experiments for a team on the ground. So you're talking to them. And the neat thing for me was now you're in space running the experiments and you get to watch what is happening. You're either like uh, melting metal and quenching it and watching the crystallization or you're burning different uh, fabrics to see how they burn and weightlessness or you're doing fluids experiments with capillary flow or you're doing experiments on your own body. Like the amount of ultrasound I've done in my own legs and my heart, my eyes, like ultrasounding your own eye and your own heart, <laughs> but just seeing the changes, like all that was fascinating. It was just like being back as a test pilot. Like you're just learning everything along with these teams. And I, I love that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. In addition to the experiments, you know, one of the insightful videos I saw you did when you were up there was some of the technology that's up there with, I mean, changing urine into drinking water and, you know, all the things that it, we need to do to be able to live up there for long periods of time. So now taking ISS, so now we're getting ready for Artemis 2. So we saw Artemis 1 go off unmanned, go around the 10-day mission around the moon. Fascinating. Loved having my kids, you know, watch that and follow okay. along. And so now we're going to do a crewed mission. So introduce us to the crew and because you're the mission commander. And in particular, we talked a lot about like, you know, two place airplanes, multiple airplanes. Who's the crew and how are you as a mission commander interacting with your pilot? and the other crew members? Great question. I guess now we're like an S3 Viking or a Prowler, right? Yeah. We've got a crew of four. Uh, myself, I am flying with, I'm not sugarcoating this. I am flying with the three greatest people that you could ever meet. They're funny, they're smart, they're just, they're so wonderful. So Victor Glover will be uh, 
with me on the crew. Uh, also, Christina Cook, who's got an engineering background and, and lived in really austere environments. And then Jeremy Hansen, who's a Canadian F-18 pilot. So oddly enough, we have three former F-18 pilots all on the crew. So yeah. uh, one of our, uh, Randy Bresnik, uh, Marine, uh, joked the other day, you know, it's Christina and her three pilots. Uh, <laughs> but it, man, this crew is so wonderful to work with. We take a lot of focus on interpersonal relations. Nothing slides. We talk about everything. But what I see when we're in these classes, first of all, I want every single one of us to fly Orion. Like we're sitting here at the base of the simulator. Yeah, so what is this here? Uh, this is uh, one of our primary places to train. So we're in a full dome uh, simulator, the Orion cockpit. Uh, you can see kind of highlighted in red behind us. We have four windows, uh, but this is where we're going to train all of our flying for Orion as we leave Earth, head around the moon. As soon as we come off the planet, uh, we're gonna do a rendezvous and prox operations demonstration using our booster, our, our upper stage as kind of a target vehicle. So we'll bring Orion off. I'm gonna hand the ship over to Victor Glover and Christina, and they're gonna operate Orion and fly around this, this upper stage to make sure all the handling qualities are great. So that'll be pure test piloting right there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's critical for me that all four crew members put their hands on the controls, that all four of us fly this vehicle, interact with this vehicle, because we got one shot to do a developmental test on this thing before we put our friends on it for Artemis III yeah. and hopefully land on the moon. So we want to make sure this thing is nailed. And getting Victor's perspective, Christina's perspective, Jeremy's perspective is going to be critical to this. Uh, and as we work through it, honestly, as the commander, I got the easiest job in the world. All I have to do is sit back and watch these three professionals work and what they bring to the table. I'm just, I'm in awe of these people every day I get to work with them. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. And so, like you mentioned, you know, one of the things that struck me is this is a test flight. We're going to go out there. We're going to test all the systems. Again, Doug Hurley kind of talked about that with Crew Dragon, yeah. where he and Bob Bankin were probably the only people who are ever going to manually fly that because right. they did that as test points. So you mentioned the ICPS, the... Uh, it's our upper stage, yeah. interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Um, and that is, once we come off the space launch system, uh, we'll be in Earth orbit. And then the uh, ICPS will boost our orbit first to 1,200 miles and then out to 38,000 miles uh, around the Earth. And that's a 24-hour orbit. We will have an insane view of the entire planet. And then if the ship is working great and all systems are go, mission control will give us a call for TLI, translunar, and, uh, and we'll use the European service module, a uh, much smaller system that's on the Orion capsule that will send us off to the moon. So that mm. upper stage is not going to power us out to the moon. It did on Artemis 1, okay. um, but for Artemis 2, we're going to use that for our rendezvous and prox ops, and then we'll power ourselves out to the moon on the Orion European service module. Okay. So we only got a few minutes left, so we're going to try to hit some We spent too things. long talking about ah, Tomcats, but... Never too long. <laughs> never too long. And I, I know there's a... You guys do a lot of interviews and stuff about what you're going to be doing. And you're going to be doing a lot. This is going to happen supposedly late 2024. Yeah, I think we're not going to make that. I think we'll be a little bit later. As the crew, we never, we don't even think about launch date. Mm -hmm. Like we are working with the teams. And when this thing is certified for flight readiness, we're, we'll be ready to go climb on board. Mm -hmm. We're a Patreon supported podcast. So we have folks who do send in some questions. So one of them, nice. uh, Matt McDonough asks, he's into watches. And so wondering what watch are you going to wear when you're <laughs> keeping time out there in space? I will wear whatever watch NASA tells me to wear. Um, <laughs> you know, branding is a huge deal. We just don't do it. We don't do it in the military as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but historically, Omega, Omega watches have been worn by all the Apollo astronauts. Uh, we have a digital Omega that we still wear to space station that we are given by NASA, and then we turn back in when we get home. I have to assume we'll be wearing something, something very similar. The, the critical thing is we will rely on a standard old wristwatch to make sure we're going out beyond the GPS constellation. We're going out to the moon. We're going where we haven't been since 1972. I was in a training class yesterday and the whole training class was focused on time mm. and how critical time is. And if the vehicle gets out of sync, how can we update it from ground? And then if we can't do that because of some failure mode, we truly are taking time off our wristwatch, punching it into the computers and hitting a reboot of time. So it's a great question. Time will be very critical for us. Yeah. We talked about the four crew. And Jeremy's pretty tall. Jeremy's not short. Yeah. And there's four of you in this for 10 days. Well, the real spacecraft's a little bigger than that. Well, but yeah. yes, <laughs> but we are in that. And, uh, you know, this you get a little bit of an idea here behind us. Uh, over in another building here, we have a, a medium fidelity, full-size mock-up. And we've gotten in there, and you know what? It's going to be tight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not crazy tight, but it's going to be tight. When we set up to go to, to bed at night, we take up most of the cabin with sleeping bags. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, it, but it'll be fun. It'll be a nine-day camping expedition. Nine-day camping expedition. With the best with view you could ever have. Best view, but no walk in the park. You're no not doing walk in the any park. external stuff. We'll do exercise. We have a, a resistance flywheel machine, so we'll get a, a few hours a day where each of us can cycle through that, so we'll get a little bit of exercise. Okay. And so, kind of from the test mission perspective, uh, you know, the test flight perspective, we talked about the proximity stuff, which is, I imagine, for when we have gateway out around so that you can steer. Gateway to human lander so that we know how to dock, how to fly around another vehicle and make sure all the systems on Orion are ready for that manual control should we need it. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head with Artemis II. It is like developmental flight test to the core. We're going to get into every manual system that we possibly can. We're going to manually point solar rays. We're going to manually introduce oxygen and nitrogen into the cabin, all the way down to like the backup to the backup manual valves, making sure that works. We're going to do our own burn targeting. We're going to do our own burns when we're flying around the the upper stage. So we're going to try to have this thing completely tested before Artemis 3. We even have a radiation shelter in the spacecraft. So we'll configure the radiation shelter in case uh, there's some sort of you know solar event that we would need to shelter on future Artemis missions. So we are going to do everything we can to get this vehicle ready for the next cruise. Mm-hmm. Another Patreon supporter, he goes by YouTuber, but he brings up a really great question that I, I wonder about. We see SpaceX Starship getting ready to try to launch again. Uh, we've seen all the amazing Falcon 9 stuff. Just walking around Johnson Space Center and learning more about the system. It's not just NASA. There's an entire ecosystem supporting this through the ESA service module and you know the Rocket 9. Everybody's in, in on this. So what's that ecosystem like and how much competition is there in the ecosystem or is it you know cooperation or how do you look at that kind of ecosystem i think if you looked in the details you could find competition everywhere and that's okay competition's a good thing but i think if you step back and look at what we're doing in artemis as a whole nasa has set a trajectory which is sustainable presence permanent sustainable presence on and around the moon so that we can advance to mars And then all of the tech that comes in to fill those holes is where my passion comes in. So is it just NASA? No, it's NASA, it's European Space Agency, it's the Canadian Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, hopefully uh, the United Arab Emirates are coming on board, the Artemis Accords for the peaceful use of the moon, now signed by 29 nations around the planet. And then where we have holes in our ability you got fixed fixed price contracts with SpaceX to build a lander, now Blue Origin coming on board to build a lander. And then where you start to get out of the glossy brochure a little bit are these commercial payload systems that NASA has said, hey, we want to land this payload on the moon. Who's going to do that for us? And so Intuitive Machines is right down the road. They're getting ready to launch. One of my former classmates, Jack Fisher, works down at Intuitive Machines. So they're launching payloads to the surface of the moon. It's amazing to step back and look at all of the private industry that's lining up behind a single vision of sustainable presence on and around the moon, future exploration on Mars, just set that goal. And then looking at the space station, commercial crew program, incredibly successful, especially on the SpaceX side, what they are doing. They've had now two private missions to the space station through Axiom. Uh, SpaceX has launched uh, one fully private mission with Jared uh, doing Inspiration4, and they're going to do another with Polaris uh, Polaris Dawn. Uh, What they're doing that's coming on the heels of commercial crew, Bob and Doug got that vehicle ready to fly with SpaceX, really talented SpaceX engineers. And now other people are reaping those benefits. And I love that. Like that to me, that's that's like, it's panacea. It's perfect. Mm. Yeah, it's a lot to do. So it's great to have so many partners Huge. involved in making that happen. It's the golden era of human spaceflight right now. I just look around. It's it's everywhere, and it's 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 a wonderful thing. Yeah, I wish we had another hour to talk, but we got to wrap it up. So, uh, so we do have a tradition. I noticed in NASA, not a lot of call sign usage, but you did have a call <laughs> sign before. Uh, do you care to share or shed light on where your call sign came from? I would love to. Okay. Uh, I, I just, you almost become your call sign. So my call sign is Tonto. And now that I live in Houston, I try to tamp down use of my call sign because fairly Spanish speaking town. Mm. And it's not the best word. It's basically idiot in uh, Spanish. But in VF 31, I had just gotten to my first fleet squadron. And you know, there's a big ceremony, the patching ceremony at the officers club that night where you get into your squadron. So I get brought into VF 31. They're putting patches all over me. I feel like King Kong, like I've made it to the gray fighter, the big gray fighter, the Tomcat. And I also get handcuffed to me this horrific 
baboon trophy called the Mother Trophy. And, and the, the guy who handcuffs it to my arm is like, hey, the junior pilot has got to carry this trophy everywhere. And you can only handcuff it to go to bed. And he gives me the keys. So I get home that night and I uncuff the trophy. I put it in my laundry basket under some laundry in my closet. I'm like, ah, no one will ever find it. And then later that night, like all these fleet aviators are coming to my house, like VF-14, VF-41. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I love this. I've arrived. Like, this is the best. (laughs) And then it dawns on me about 30 minutes later. Oh, no, they're here to steal the trophy. (laughs) So I go back upstairs and trophy's gone. Clothes are everywhere. And I called uh, my CEO at the time was Victor Olivares. He's a Spanish guy. And he just walks in on Saturday morning. We had to have an all air crew meeting because of me. I had lost this trophy. (laughs) So I'm in the fleet for not even 24 hours and I've already had an all air crew meeting called for me. And Victor Olivares walks right in the ready room and he's just like, Tonto. And that was it, man. I was Tonto forever. And, uh, and I love it. It's a great, it's a, just a great, it's a good call sign. And it really embodies me. Like I just, I like to be myself and humans are going to make mistakes and we just get to work and be as professional as we can every single day. And there are going to be hiccups along the way and just try to deal with them all and, and carry on. Yep. That's great. We have to end and it's a great story to end on. So here's a little guest patch that we give all of our guests when we come on. So this is a really special time for us. So I want you to have Love these that. things. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll make sure these get put in a special spot and maybe snuck on Orion if I can make it happen. Well, that would be amazing. I know weight is important out there. So again, Reed, really great to see you. Always. Um, really wonderful to follow along on your continued expeditions uh, out to the atmosphere and beyond. So really look forward to, to seeing that and seeing what you and the NASA team and everybody else gets to make out of this Artemis missions and and towards the vision. So thanks for spending time with us on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You bet. All right, Flounder, that was really cool. Man, I didn't know Tonto in the fleet, but NASA sure knows how to pick them because, my goodness, poised, energetic, knowledgeable. What a stud. Yeah, absolutely. He's always been a great personality around Oceana, a great personality around, you know, my interactions with him intelligent, uh, personable. It just, he's the whole thing. I think I had a man crush. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Is that a little weird? (laughs) Anyway, well, I love the story about juggling. I never tried that. I did do the chair flying he talked about, but I don't know, that might be a new, I guess, maybe requirement for student naval aviators and flight officers in the future? I don't know. I've (laughs) I've tried juggling a couple times without thinking about anything else, and I can't do it. So I can't imagine doing that with emergency procedures. Yeah, well, hey, it seemed to work. So talented dude. I love the fact, too, that he dropped a bunch of names of uh, folks that have been on the show. Uh, Combat Kimmel from episode 184 on, I think it was the Fighter Pilot Best Practices. Of course, Scott Tingle, he was a roommate of mine Mm -hmm. on the uh, 03 deployment on Nimitz. He was on, uh, let's see, what, episode 29. And then you had Doug Hurley on episode 153, I think it was. That's right. So yeah, small world, I guess. It, it is. It's almost every day that I run into sharing names with people and stuff yeah. like that. So it is a small world yeah. in our community. And I don't know Bob Bankin real well, but I actually stayed at his house because um, <laughs> I know his wife, Megan, who was a friend of mine from UCLA. And so, yeah, it's just so cool to see all that. Now, it doesn't surprise me, by the way, that Matt McDonough, who's a supporter of the show, asked about watches because he has a podcast called The Spirit of Time. He loves watches. He had me on his show, and I was sort of apologetically saying, sorry, Matt, I'm really not that much of a watch guy, but this particular one has a great story. I ended up writing about it on the fighterpilotpodcast.com blog we call musings but uh you had some pretty good questions and yeah that one uh, didn't surprise me omega though huh that yeah was a good shout out for those guys that that's right and wasn't sure how reed was gonna respond but i thought he had a great response because you know it's interesting to think about space flight going beyond our gps constellation yeah where it really goes back to some of the stuff we see in like apollo 13 of manually entering information and making sure the systems are working right so great question <laughs> Well, and I've got my Omega on, so I don't know that much about any of this, but I thought I heard like time sort of like changes. Like if if you get in your spaceship and you push play on some VHS movie Mm. and I'm on Earth and I push play on some VHS movie and you come back from space, like they won't be synced up still. I've heard that as well. So I don't know about his watch. I mean, if it's just a simple watch. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I think that our viewers and listeners are going to have to go to two different people to answer the theory of relativity and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be me. Yeah, for sure. Now, you recorded this on, I think, Halloween, 
of 2023. That's right. You and I are recording this almost on, I think, Leap Day is tomorrow or next day, February of 24. So what's new with the Artemis program that you've heard of since then? Yeah. I mean, when we recorded this, one of the things that Reed talks about is the ecosystem that goes along with the Artemis mission. I mean, we've got SpaceX and all the different stuff they're doing with Falcon and Falcon Heavy and the Starship. He mentions intuitive machines, which, as he said, they were preparing to land. Well, they just landed on the moon uh, within the last week. Uh, Starship launched out of their Texas Boca Chica facility shortly after we'd recorded the interview. They had a successful flight, though it was and ended up in a rapid decomposition. Got a lot of great data, another great success as they move forward and are going to be preparing to do their third one. So even in the time since we have we recorded, you know, there's so many things in that ecosystem that have progressed uh, towards the goal of landing and having a sustainable presence around the moon and then Mars. So I don't have an update on when the Artemis II mission is going to go. As he says in the podcast, you know, that it was originally slated for late 2024, but he didn't think at the time it was going to happen this year. So we'll see what happens with that. But all these other things are happening. Yeah. Too. Well, we don't need to be the authority on when it's going to go. I exactly. mean, if anyone's really that interested, go to the NASA website or something, and I'm sure you'll find the most up to date information. Mm, but that's right. yeah, but. Flounder, even, so you say you like space stuff, even unrelated to going back to the moon, which itself is amazing. I thought I saw something recently. Is uh, Russia trying to do some weaponizing of some satellites or something right now? What else is going on in space? Yeah, I mean, there is there is that competition in space. I mean, it's a very busy area. So mm -hmm. first of all, you've got China and their movements in um, a space station, and, and you've got Russia and what they want to do. As far as weaponizing, I think that, We've seen that term in the media, and so, you know, therefore, I don't really know how much to really say that it's being weaponized. But we all know that there have been weapons. I mean, China exhibited the um, anti-satellite weapons. I'm sure we've got stuff to be able to take out satellites, both kinetically and, of course, with cyber stuff. So there is that, and Space Force has done some exercises to be able to try to, you know, train and practice towards defending our satellite ecosystem, which everything relies upon, not just military equipment, but, you know, Amazon drone deliveries or everything in our economy runs on space. And so that's why it's critically important to be able to do well. Interestingly, we also have a lot of other things that are developing with like space tugs to be able to service vehicles in space. Uh, debris removal. So a lot of interesting, innovative companies that are going after that space ecosystem. Is it the second golden age of space, perhaps? Or maybe? I, I certainly think it's <laughs> it's a golden age. You yeah. know, it's uh, it, it and it's accelerating at a, a rapid pace. I mean, going back to well, what's the vision? I mean, there's we're going to have in a few years, we're going to have a basically a space station modeled off of the ISS, which is the gateway, which is going to orbit the moon. And then we will be able to have people living on that in the habitation and logistics uh, section of that Gateway Space Station and be able to shuttle logistics back and forth to the moon to develop that permanent presence on the moon near the South Pole. And then that, of course, will be a jumping off station for the Mars mission. So fascinating time to be into the space world. Indeed. Well, big thanks again to you for conducting that interview and to Tonto and all the folks down there. I know you had a bunch of them that you were emailing regularly to not only set it up, but I think since then they're like, hey, so when are you guys going to air that? So <laughs> we finally got you down to San Diego so we could introduce and then wrap up that interview. So big thanks to all of them again. Before I let you run though, what else are you working on? You talked about when you were on that side of the table doing our Naval Flight Officers interview, you had an interview coming up with Nasty. That's an audio only show. That's so right. So whether audio or video, what else is uh, on your docket? So great conversation with Nasty uh, that'll be out, I think, in a few weeks after this one. But video-wise, we've got a great uh, guest on the show. It's uh, Tamara Graham, uh, Tilo. And so she is going to talk about combat search and rescue. So she was a helicopter pilot and squadron uh, XO and CO when I was in the Black Knights. So we did some CSAR and RMC, the uh, rescue mission commander that Tonto and I had talked about because it was actually in that moment in the interview with Tonto that I thought to myself, 
that would be a great episode. Now I need to focus on what Kanto is saying. So that's what caused me to reach out to Tilo. And, Fantastic. And so it's a it, it's a great episode. I'm looking forward to that one. Well. I am as well. Good. So I appreciate that. And again, everything you did for this episode. And appreciate all of you watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Now, we just threw out some terms, CSAR, RMC. But there's probably some others that snuck by the goalie. If you're unfamiliar with any of those, head on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where you can find a glossary of all these terms. While you're there, you can also find find some really cool military aviation books and uh, also some merch as well as a blog that we call Musings and all the video episodes. So that will do it for this episode. Thanks again, Flounder. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. We'll see you next time.